Warning, the following video may contain pictures of graphic depictions that may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewers' discretion is advised. At last, it's the weekend. You decided to meet up with a few friends and have some fun. After a good meal and a couple of shots here and there, you started to feel nauseous, beginning to stagger as your friends caught you before you fell over. That's it for the night, you mumbled to your friends, who was then nice enough to call you a cab. After giving the cabbie your address, your friends waved goodbye as the cab set off into the darkness of the night. Still drunk and in a confused state of mind, you try your hardest to grasp at the brief moment of clarity, so you can see the scenery outside. Flashing by were buildings you are, at, you are not at all familiar with, roads leading to a place you did not know. Pulling your eyes back from the view outside, you glance over at the driver who hasn't spoken a single word the entire ride. Before passing out once again, you were gripped by the rising sense of fear, spawned from the sudden realization that you were driven by a complete stranger, placing your faith and your life in his hands trusting him that he would take you home. But what if, what if this man is not just your average, average cabbie? What if this man is something more, a sexual predator, or worse, a serial killer? It's too late now, as you drifted off. All you could do was hope that it was all a moment of paranoia and panic as the alcohol ran through your veins. Let's hope that is indeed the case. Thank you all for joining us for the second episode of our channel. Uh, first, I must apologize for the long time it takes to put this video up. Um, but let's get to the case. Uh, I choose this case specifically because it have a, even on an unconscious level, have a lot of impact on uh, how the people of Hong Kong deal with uh, taxi cabs especially for females when they travel at night. Um, in Hong Kong, for public transportations, pretty much after midnight, you really don't have a lot of choices. Uh, taxi cabs would be the, the main uh, form of transportation if you have to travel that late at night. Um, it also um, inspire a lot of uh, new regulations uh, about the taxi industry, and specifically uh, uh, this have been since then uh, required uh, for the cab drivers to have their license uh, and their picture ID displayed uh, prominently inside a cab that was somewhere uh, the, the customers can see. Uh, it also um, made people more aware of the danger of traveling at night by themselves. Um, it's now pretty much a common practice when, when uh, a friend travels at night, get on the taxi, their friends, uh, the people who see them off, would uh, sometimes write down the, the taxi driver's uh, physical description or the license plate number of the taxi, and they will call the, the friends after they get home just to make sure they got home safe. Um, so uh, that's pretty much the reason why I picked this case, and this also this case is a very, very famous case, one of the few uh, actual serial killers uh, who have been documented in uh, Hong Kong history. Um, so let's get on with this case. On February 12, 1982, the Hong Kong Royal Police received a call about the discovery of a severed human head at the banks of the Shengmen River in front of the Sha Tin Plaza located in the Sha Tin District. Upon arrival, Officers discovered a decomposing human head near the banks, with the preservation of crime scenes not being prevalent at the time, reporters were allowed to wander around near the location where the head was found without hindrance. Soon after, a pair of human feet were found close by, discovered by one of the news reporters who were at the scene. Before the day's end, a pair of hands and the trunk of the body were also found in the Shengmen River, further downstream, in front of the Bel Air Garden and Tai Shi Hang area, respectively. 
Initially, police were faced with a difficult task of identif identifying the victim due to the decomposition. However, as the arms were discovered, they were able to identify the victim through the tattoo she had on her shoulder, along with unique false teeth that were made of gold. The victim was identified as 21-year-old nightclub escort Chen Feng Lan. On February 3rd, around 4 in the morning, Chen went out for a drink with some of her friends after getting off of work. After the outing, Chen got onto the cab of Lam Ko Wen. He then drove her to the Kuantong district as requested. After noticing Chen passed out in the back, Lam drove the taxi back to his own residence in the To Kuan Wan district, where he lived with his family. After stopping near his residence, he went home and retrieved some electrical wires, which he then used to strangle the passed out Cheng Feng Lan to death. He moved Cheng's body back to his home and hid it under the sofa in his family's living room without his family noticing. The next day, Lam stripped Cheng's body, took some pictures of her naked corpse, and took $500 from her purse. He bought an electric saw with the money she, he took, then dismembered her body into seven separate pieces and wrapped them in plastic bags, videotaped and photographed the entire process. He also took out her sexual organs prior to dis the dismemberment and preserved them in rice wine inside some Tupperware containers before disposing of the rest of the body parts at the Shengmun River. Lam's second victim was Chen Wen Kit, a 31-year-old cashier. On May 29, 1982, at approximately 5.20 a.m., Kit got out of, off of work and, under heavy rain, got onto Lam's taxi cab. While on their way, Lam took out a knife and threatened Kit with physical harm unless she cooperated. He then handcuffed Kit and strangled her with electrical wires. Improving on his process, Lam decided to use a medical scalpel to cut off Kit's breast took out her reproductive organs in its entirety and then preserved them just as he had done with his first victim. He then wrapped the remainder of the body parts in newspaper and stuffed them in hemp bags. After temporarily storing the bags in the trunk of his taxi cab, he waited until sundown to dispose of them as the grassies, at the grassy slopes next to Taihan Road an upscale residential area in Causeway Bay located on the Hong Kong Island. He named the video tapes containing the dismemberment process for his first two victims as serious secrets. His third victim was Leung Sao Wan, a 29-year janitor. On June 17, 1982, at approximately 4 a.m., Leung got on Lam's taxi cab after work and was subsequently murdered. Lam bought her body home to photograph and videotape the dismemberment process. He named the tape Rainy Night Operation. To allow himself more freedom to work on his victim, this time he placed the video recorder on the bunk bed he shared with his younger brother and recorded the entire process. Because he no longer had to hold a camera while he worked on the corpse, he was more detailed and careful when dissecting and dismembering his latest victim. At one point, he cut open the stomach and pulled out the victim's intestines in order for him to attempt cannibalism. Though from his recount on the event, he did not go through with it because he felt sick and nauseous after trying a taste with his mouth. The body parts of Leung were then discarded by Lam at Taihang Road. Lam's last victim, as he recounted to the police in his confession, was a 17-year-old student by the name of Leung Wai Sum. On July 2, 1982, around 11 p.m., Leung Wai Sum got onto Lam's taxi cab after an alumni dinner at Jim Sa Choi. According to Lam, Leung was the victim he spent the most time with while still alive. After handcuffing the girl, Lam spent a long time talking to her on various subjects. From school, outlook on the future, family, religion, even to the afterlife. Despite the long conversation he had with the girl, Lam still ended up strangling her with electrical wires like his other victims. Besides dismembering the teenage student, 
Lam also carried out necrophilia on her body, something he had never done with any of his previous victims. According to Lam, this was because he saw her as the purest among all of his victims. Lam titled the videotape containing the dismemberment process of Lam as Operation Number 4. Lam disposed of her body on the hillside next to the Taihang Road in Causeway Bay. On August 10, 1982, Lam was arrested at a photo developing shop attempting to pick up enlarged pictures of dismembered body parts belonging to his latest victim, Leung Wai Sum. Police found out later that Lam had actually joined a formal photography club some time ago and befriended an employee of the photo development store. By claiming to work as a photographer for the coroner at a local morgue, Lam was able to convince his new friend to aid him in developing some of the pictures he had taken of his victims. However, unbeknownst to him, when he returned to develop more pictures of his last victim, the machine at the store his friend worked at was out of service, forcing his friend to pass the task over to another store nearby. After seeing the pictures of dismembered female body parts, the store manager there decided to contact the police and in turn, a trap was set for Lam at his usual store, awaiting his return. To confirm Lam's undeniable involvement in the, murder, in the murder of his victims, the detectives purposely mixed all the pictures in with the ones Lam had ordered extra prints of when he returned, so that Lam wouldn't be able to claim that the pictures of the body parts were the result of a simple mix-up by the store. After Lam's arrest, along with his father and brother in August, the Royal Hong Kong Police compiled a list of recently missing females and informed the press that up to a total of 15 girls might have already been killed by Lam. Although the police suspected Lam might have killed more than the four murders which he confessed to, the prosecutor's office opted to proceed with his trial without conducting further investigations into any additional victims that he might have killed to speed up the legal proceedings and secure a conviction. Lam's father and brother were arrested initially as a common practice by the police at the time, in order to force the suspect to confess by using other family members as collateral, basically saying, confess and we'll leave your family alone. However, in Lam's case, this actually backfired. Because Lam's father had been physically and verbally abusive to Lam since he was a child, at times even slapping him for simply failing to address everybody prior to a meal. After allowing the three to meet while in custody, Lam's brother broke down and begged Lam to confess, which he did since Lam was on good terms with his brother for most of his life. Looking back in his past records, the police found out that he had a prior run-in with the law in 1973. He was arrested and tried for sexual assault on a female at a public restroom, in which he rubbed his hand against the victim's genitals after holding a knife to her. After a psychological evaluation, Lam was deemed unfit for trial at the time. He was then sent to Castle Peak Hospital in Tun Mun, where he received 102 days of treatment and subsequently released. He received his taxi license in 1978 and became a member of a photo photography club in 1981. Lam Kong Wan's trial began on March 3, 1983, in the Hong Kong Supreme Court. He was found guilty and was sentenced to death. But due to the death penalty being abolished, his death sentence was commuted to life imprisonment in August of 1984. On the screen, you can see a recent picture of Lam, taken in 2009 as he walked in the prison yard where he is still serving out his life sentence. In 2014, Apple Daily, a Hong Kong newspaper, reported that as of 2014, Lam had not attempted to apply for parole. According to some sources, the title, Rainy Night Butcher, was not referring to the weather condition when he committed the murders, as some people have thought, 
but instead it was a nickname Lamb had picked out for himself. When he was first arrested, he allegedly found out about the nickname the newspaper had given him at the time and hated it. He was called the Late Night Butcher at the time. He wanted to be called Rainy Night Butcher because he was born on a rainy night. Here's some additional tidbits of information on the case. Uh, a couple years ago, a TV show did uh, uh, research and found out uh, where Lamb had lived with his family at the time of the murders and found out that the, the apartment that he lived in uh, had been sold a couple of times and is currently listed uh, about 30% under market value and they actually went to the, the apartment and in, tried to interview the people who were living there who of course have no idea about the murders that had taken place there. Um, because of how famous this case is, there are actually a numerous uh, number of TV shows and movies that were made about a case. The most famous one being the movie version that was made in 1992. Uh, they used a lot of the exact date of the murder, the trial, and some of the names of the victims um, in the movie. And in uh, 1982, interestingly, right before the murder took place, there were actually a movie with pretty much the exact uh, storyline as the murders. The movie was called Heat Wave. Um, also in 2010, um, the English uh, criminal uh, program called Criminal Investigation Asia actually did a special on uh, Lam Kong Wen, entitled The George Murderer. That's it for this episode. Thank you all for watching. Uh, sorry about the late upload. Um, it's just getting a little tough to get a recording out when you're a full-time job and have to take care of families. Um, I will uh, try to put some of the additional information on the description. Uh, like I said, because of how famous this case is, there are actually a lot of TV programs and YouTube videos and the like uh, put out by people who lived in Hong Kong. Um, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this uh, episode and the information provided. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.